Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. This episode is brought to you by Overwolf. With over 1,500 games supported, 165,000 creators, and 38 million monthly active users, Overwolf is the guild for in-game creators. Whether you're a gamer, creator, or game studio, Overwolf is the ultimate destination for integrating UGC in games. For game studios, Overwolf offers CurseForge for Studios, a white label solution that lets game makers and publishers easily integrate mods safely and seamlessly into their games, both existing and new, at zero cost. It's battle tested by AAA studios and games, including Maxis with The Sims 4, Studio Wildcard with Arc, Take Two Interactive, and others. For creators, Overwolf is the all-in-one platform that enables creators to build, distribute, and monetize in-game apps, mods, and game servers. In 2022, Overwolf paid over $160 million to in-game creators, proving that they truly value the talents and contributions of the gaming community. You can check out everything Overwolf has to offer at overwolf.com or check out the details in the show notes. And with that, let's jump into the episode. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Aaron Bush, and today I am excited to chat with David Kay. David is a longtime games industry entrepreneur who more recently became a venture capitalist as the co-founder and general partner of F4 Fund. As such, nothing said here today is financial or investment advice, but I wanted to have him on because I find his views on building and investing in gaming startups to be uniquely refreshing and thoughtful. Now, if you heard David previously on our roundtable episodes or have read any of his essays on Substack, you probably have come to appreciate his honest takes for what works and doesn't work when investing in gaming, how startups can stand out and outperform in today's environment, and what the future has in store for our industry. We will dive into all of that today, but without further ado, David, welcome back to the Novic Gaming Podcast. Thanks, Aaron. Happy to be here. So... As I mentioned, we got a bunch of topics to dive into today, but really where we should start is just setting the scene. Um, and the best place to begin there is just to learn a bit more about you. So first, could you just quickly run us through your career as a game maker and a games industry entrepreneur? Sure. I'm going to give you the very, the, the 30 second version. Uh, I spent about 25 years as an entrepreneur in games, started out making text-based online role-playing games. Since then, I've helped to build companies doing uh, social games, was an advice to some of the early mobile game companies, um, and then most recently built a more PC and console-focused studio called Snapshot Games that was acquired by Embracer in uh, 2020 and uh, started the fund um, January of last year. And if I'm not mistaken, your first company, you started when you were in high school. What was that experience like for you and shaping your trajectory and just like what you learned as a high school entrepreneur? Because that's super unique. It was tr- yeah, it was uh, transformative. I, it came from, I, I got kind of addicted to uh, a, a mud called Avalon. Um, this is in when I was like 13. And uh, this is pre-internet, actually. They had a bunch of modems you could dial into. And they had some really grotty offices in uh, Camden. That we'd go, my friends and I would go there on the weekends. And um, we uh, and that was my first introduction to like multiplayer, to online gaming, you know, pre-internet. And then I sort of came back to it. I was just curious, checked in on it. Obviously, it, it went on the internet a few years later. And I met my first business partner, Matt Mihaly, on that game and we kind of got to know each other and he's like hey I'm, i want to make a game and i was like oh cool that sounds like more fun than doing my homework and uh <laughs> that was s- sort of uh that was yeah that was sort of the the start of everything in fact actually one of the founders of avalon was a guy called daniel james who um is has been an also a games entrepreneur his whole career is based here in san francisco and is uh he's actually an lp in our funds so he's like the person i've known him now for god 30 plus years um, so yeah, shout out to Dan for uh, 
<laughs> for starting me down this uh, this this slippery slope. No, that's amazing. And now you, as a venture capitalist, get to look for the next David Gaze who are out there building quirky, quirky no, stuff. No, more. I, I want to find the people who are much more successful than 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 David than me. That's the okay. that's the goal well, of me. Don't sell yourself short there, but uh, <laughs> understood. Uh, well, let's go ahead and, and shift gears. How did you move into the investing and venture side of things? Like, when did you first kind of get that investing itch and kind of realize this would be a good um, next phase for your career? So, um, years before this, um, I've done yeah, the only other thing I've done aside from starting game companies really is I um, also started this community that became a company called gaming insiders and uh you know we ended up it was was a kind of a start as a mailing list for founders in the games business um and grew into more of a media and events company um but the part of it i really enjoyed the most was spending time with other founders i got to meet just so many great great entrepreneurs some of whom are you know still still friends and colleagues today you know it was uh and so I think what my one regret was, man, I, if I had had a fund <laughs> then to, cause I, I was really, you know, I, I had a pretty good eye for talent. And so, uh, that was always in the back of my mind. And then I, I knew after, after snapshot was acquired, I, I kind of knew I didn't really want to start another game company. Um, and so, so circled back around to this idea and, uh, got some encouragement from some, from some friends who became LPs and that was kind of the beginning. And so now you have F4, and maybe you could tell us a bit about it. Like, how did that come together? What is your focus? Who's the team? Just whatever whatever context uh, you think yeah. is most relevant and helpful. Sure. So F4 is a pre-seed and seed stage fund that invests in the future of media. Well, really, it's the future of media and communications, I suppose. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think we need to spend too long on, like, the thesis, but... I, I sort of my, my perception was I I really wanted uh, I, I obviously coming from games and my, my partner also comes from games clearly that's an area of interest for us but yeah I think the thing that's interesting about games is it's really always been of all the content industries the first to adopt new technology new distribution models and it's uh and so I think if you spend a lot of time in games it really um, and I've always been really interested in media in, in the broadest possible sense from, you know, building stuff on, on the, you know, the early days of Facebook to just tracking the development of streaming and how and all those worlds are increasingly technology driven and colliding in all kinds of interesting ways. And I just sort of want us to be at the center of it. Nice. And maybe you could just share a bit more about like what kind of companies have you invested in so far? I think you got, you made your first investment about a year ago, but how has this first year shaped up for you and, you know, helping you create your strategy and, you know, just help like narrow in on the types of businesses that are the best fit for your fund? Yeah. Um, well, it's been a really interesting first year. We've learned a lot. Um, I mean, as far as the kinds of investments that we've made, I would say about a third of the portfolio is in games. Um, beyond outside of games, it's um, it's really a mixture of we have a little bit in kind of consumer and social. We invested in a in a, in a dating app called called Blush. We are um, we also are, are a seed investor in a the kind of loyalty and cash back uh, business called uh, Benjamin that that has a also has a, a strong gaming dimension for uh, helping publishers to acquire users using some very unique data that they're able to get access to mm. um, I mean that investment is doing incredibly well um so we're we're, we're sort of um it's been a it's been great we've been I think we've been we've also the year has been also about learning <laughs> So that sounds really bad to say as a as a, as a VC, um, but like learning how to invest, <laughs> but like I, I think like yeah, how to play the game, a little bit. I I I, I wouldn't put it that way because that kind of makes it sound I don't know I, I don't, that makes it sound worse than than, than it is. But I, in some ways, but it, it's more been thinking about in in the same way that you know as an entrepreneur, your job is to figure out what you can uniquely bring into the world that is necessary that is that is needed um i think as an in the great investors also have a very very strong sense of 
what they're about and what they bring, what they can sort of uniquely bring, um, and and they can express that both through the 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 ways that they work with companies and actually how they structure their investments as well. And so I would say that at the outset, I was probably a, little, a bit more naive. I was bringing more of an angel. I did, you know, I did some angel investing prior to this. And you know, as an angel, you can just be sort of pretty much, you can be pretty simplistic about it. Like, oh, I like this founder. I like, I like this idea. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to put some money behind it. But I think as a, as, a, as a VC, you obviously have to be a lot more sort of disciplined and structured and um, I think like that's been a real learning process, but uh, I feel really good about the progress that we that we've made um, in in the year that we've been doing it. Nice. Any other big learnings uh, for the year? Well, I, again, sticking with the sort of the, the investing side, I think um, it, it comes down to um, just discipline around things things that could be you know you, you might this might be a really interesting company, a great entrepreneur, but it, it may or may not be a good investment depending on all sorts of things. Um, yeah, like your entry price, and and so I think it's, um, yeah, I I, got, I wrote a piece a little while ago about um about about like what I learned in that first year, and I think a, a big learn a big takeaway is also learning. Look, we're a small fund, right? We're a ten million dollar fund, and um, that means there are things that we can't do that that the you know that the big funds can, but at the same time, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of areas where we can play, and that. Uh, just don't make sense for a big fund because they have so much more capital to deploy. So in some ways, like I, I don't, you know, I, I don't envy the huge funds um, just looking at the kind of returns they have to, that, that, that they're looking for um, on the amount of capital that they have. It's not an easy job. Um, so I think learning more about how our size can be a, a, you know, a real advantage in some ways is has been eye-opening. Nice. Uh, well, I'm sure we could talk about learnings much more. Maybe we'll get to some more later, but uh, let's go ahead and and zoom out a bit. Part of why I wanted to have this conversation, as I, I mentioned in the intro, is because you had some like pretty unique and thoughtful takes about investing in the games industry. Some might dare to call them spicy. Um, and um, for example, you know, maybe a year ago when you were starting to, to invest out of F four, you you were talking about how ninety nine percent of games studios should not raise venture capital, and I think you know at the time maybe there were some grumblings about that. Today it's become, as we were talking about before we even hit record, that seems to become a bit more accepted, and you know what uh, you know other investors and in industry at large thinks about. But um, even so, that's a pretty striking comment to make, given that. You know, companies making the content are the vast majority of the games industry and drive you know a huge percentage of the the entire revenue for the industry. And so, I would love for you to break that down more. Why are ninety nine percent of you know game studios not fit for venture capital? Well, I think first I'm going to give a, a little caveat, which is that. Um, I'm giving it from the perspective of a, a VC in terms of like how I think about deploying capital. If I sort of take off my VC hat and I put on an entrepreneur hat, um, I think the thing to, to note is like, A, not everyone agrees with me. And B, like your responsibility is uh, as a founder is like get money. Like if there's there's funds out there that are dedicated pools of capital to deploy, like go after that money like 100%. Um, so like that, I'll... I'll all right, I'll take that hat off and put put the VC hat back on. And I think it comes down to a, a few a few things. I think you just have to understand what venture capital is, right? And the core issue, I think, is that VC is an asset class that is really best suited to industries that can deliver and companies that can deliver very high velocity growth. And I think looking at the gaming sector. It really only does this periodically, and it's usually in the wake of some sort of platform shift-driven market expansion. Mobile being obviously the, the the most recent and the largest in that you know in that in in history. Really, outside of those periods, it's historically been quite hard to deliver venture scale returns and if you look at the the vast majority of venture scale outcomes that have come you know in the last few years it's all come from mobile which was companies building that were in the right place at the right time executed really really well and created a ton of value and and mobile was actually 
especially pre-ATT, was uniquely well positioned to deliver that kind of growth because you could build uh, a, a game relatively cheaply. And then if it worked, you could pour huge amounts of money into scaling it, um, which you can actually still, well, you can't really build super cheaply anymore, but you still can pour lots of money into scaling. But there's a whole bunch of reasons why I think it's much harder. That's a much harder game for startups to play relative to big companies like like Scopely. Um, and I think like looking at the game studio, the, you know, the, the, the game studio thing specifically, I, I think a lot of the most durable competitive advantages of studios are actually built over time. And, you know, the taking a long time is somewhat, is pretty antithetical to the, like, to what VCs want you to do, right? That's like hurts their returns. And so, you know, you look at some of the big success stories, especially when you look at the sort of the the uh, the, the PC space that a lot of funds have more recently pivoted into. A lot of the studios that everyone, the games that everyone, you know, really respects and loves, you know, companies like Larian and uh, from software and, you know, companies like this, these have all, their, their, their advantages have been built over long periods of time. They've built a reputation, they built a studio brand, they've built a kind of an understanding in the audience, they've cultivated an audience for the kinds of games that they make specifically. They've been able to build internal teams, they've been able to build resources, tools, uh, and, and their sort of culture of working together and making the getting really good at making the kinds of games that they make. And, um, you know, none of that is, um, is, 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 is easy, is, is easy to do quickly. Yeah. And obviously there's a huge difference between trying to, um, pitch a game <laughs> versus pitch a company, uh, that have yes. so many more elements to it. But I guess it leads me to my follow-up, which is, you know, if 99% of those companies shouldn't like, what are the traits and characteristics of the one percent <laughs> that should? Like, what what do you see as making those teams special, where they kind of rise above the rest and are more deserving? Yeah. Um. So I think I'll give a very practical numbers based answer, and then maybe a, a sort of a, a broader one. Uh, I think the short the short answer is, and like we're a seed, yeah, we invest at pre seed and seed. So I'd say first of all, if you think. Um, you can sell your company for at least 25 times your seed valuation within you know seven to ten years. Then think about doing venture capital. Um, and I think like and and specifically have really good answers for what elements of your plan and the market make you think that this sort of return, this sort of growth profile is is plausible. And I think also you should sort of need to also be honest that like with yourself about do you actually want to do this? in this way, because there are many game developers, including some of the ones I've just been talking about that probably would love to do this for as long as, as humanly possible. They don't really want to put themselves on some sort of trajectory where they're looking to you know, exit to a strategic investor or to IPO or something like that. Um, so I think the first thing is like, what, what do you actually, you know, what do you want to sign up for? And, and if it's not some version of that, then I think it's probably wise to investigate other other options, whether that's you know bootstrapping, working with publishers, crowdfunding, you know, working with angel investors, things like this. Um, I would say that the companies that are the best fit for venture are ones that could ultimately become something larger than a single game company or 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 at least can build that game into a platform of some kind that creates an opportunity to have a more uncapped return profile because really like what a vc is looking for is a plausible is a plausible scenario in which you could be worth hundreds of millions or or ideally billions of dollars and that's not going to come from, hey, we built a really cool game and put it on Steam. Yeah. And also much easier said than done, especially when you haven't. It, I guess it's tough to pitch being a platform when you're still <laughs> at a pre seed stage. Like, how do you think through, you know, those kinds of pitches and opportunities that come along to kind of separate 
you know, what is real and has potential versus, you know, what is mostly talk. You're right. You can't sort of pit, you can't come out of the gates. I mean, there's a lot of companies that do obviously try and build platforms, you know, right out the gate, and and that's yeah. that's typically very challenging. Um, I do think that I mean, looking at gaming, like just focusing on on companies that are actually building games, um, I, I do think it is actually quite reasonable to um, expect that we will see more games that. So if if Roblox is sort of a horizontal world, like a horizontal UGC platform. Uh, I think it's plausible to imagine, uh, and we have already seen some of these, uh, a number of games becoming sort of more vertical worlds. So there is actually a game and an audience there to begin with, but the game is really built from uh, the the ground up to eventually become a place where the players, some p- proportion of the audience can participate in creating on, on that platform and in that game. Um, and I think it's it's reasonable to have that in your you know, in your plan um, at, at the earliest stages, even if you are making clear that the sequencing is going to be you know that's going to probably happen a bit down the road. Yeah, maybe you can break that down slightly more for us. Like, what exactly do you mean by vertical? Is it just that users can build on your game, or is it a or is there more to it than that? Also, you wrote about this on your Substack, and we've talked about it a few times. So feel free to. You know, tell people where they can find. Yeah, no, I, I, I did. I wrote, I wrote a piece about. I think, yeah, I think that's where I coined this, this, this term, vertical world. But like, for example, um, you can imagine a, um, a shooter, for instance, like you're, and you're, with the that comes out with a set of modding tools. You're not going to use it to cr- go and create, a, you know, a platform game, uh, or something, you know, completely outside. Both the the genre or the um, or the theme of of the game, but yeah. it might come with a set of tools that allow you to create different kinds of shooter experiences or 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 levels or missions or stories or what or all kinds of different things within that universe. So that the the replay. I mean, look, we've seen this. There are there are examples of this happening. I mean, Skyrim is this really um, in a <laughs> yeah. uh, in a way. I mean. It, that's people more creating additional content for the game, but I, I think more of those can thrive than I think. There's there's going to be a hard there's a hard limit on the number of the horizontal sort of everything platforms that that are that that can achieve any kind of scale. Whereas I think there's there's a room for quite a lot of winners potentially in the if they're taking a more vertical approach. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, even just when you look at kind of the growth and the the modern day modding community and, you know, seeing kind of the rise of premium mods now, you know, private servers, all that kind of stuff. What you're saying makes sense and can take many forms. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how that that plays out. So if most gaming companies shouldn't raise venture capital um, and, you know, there are the one percent that really stand out. I assume are like the more competitive deals, and then there's there's the rest. Some of which still you know end up raising money in in, in some way. Um, you know that has an impact on the valuations that companies have, kind of influencing you know just like the state of how investors must think about the market. Um, you recently wrote a piece about why gaming valuations are too high. Maybe you can kind of tie this all together for us. Kind of share why that is and and break this down in a bit more detail for the audience. Sure. So I really have one main job as a as a as a as an investor and that is to deliver really good returns to my investors, the limited partners who are who have invested in our fund. And at the end of the day that's driven by a fairly simple calculus it's how much are we paying for the stock that we're buying and how much are we able to sell that for on exit and i think when i said that i you know what that i think early stage you know some of this sort of especially the pre-seed gaming valuations are too high um really what i meant was I did not. I feel like we see a lot of deals where we do not feel we are being adequately compensated for the amount of risk that we are taking at that stage, and and I and I the reason I say that is 
because as, as we, because we are not just a gaming fund, right? We invest across media and communications. We see we see a lot of companies in a lot of different areas, and it's really really striking. Uh, I can get into specific in some numbers since we you know GDC was not not all that long ago. You know, it's still not uncommon to see game pitches for from from game companies where they are looking for a valuation of anywhere from 10 to 20 million dollars in some cases at a very very early stage often there's just a pitch deck or maybe something very very rudimentary but really not very de-risked and uh, at all and there's also uh, quite a lot of capital is going to be needed and this is just the, you know, part of it is that's the nature of games to 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 de-risk the 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 investment in any way whatsoever and so for me as a gp i'm looking at that and then i look at other deals that we've that we've done where we can see a company in the, that's maybe a, you know, a more of a technology company in in doing something in the media space and they've built a version one product already they maybe already have a few hundred thousand dollars in you know annual recurring revenue it's growing you know 30 percent month on month and they're raising at a you know 10 million dollar post money valuation or you know as the seed some of the a seed well, our recent seed investment we did which had just you know was was i think it you know we, we invested at a in the high 20s but they were already had multiple millions in arr and um it just when you put those deals alongside the hey here's my cool game idea <laughs> um you know pitch deck it just feels sort of irresponsible <laughs> to deploy uh, too much into the latter, basically. Yeah, I I think that's that's fair. And of course, the everything changes all the time, right? And so you know where we are now is different from where we were a year or two ago. And I imagine a year or two from now, it will continue to evolve. So there's always this, you know, give and take, this push and pull between all the parties that play it, where <laughs> this ultimately, you know, lands kind of across an entire industry and how it evolves but you know another I, piece I, of this i have one very i, I have one very experienced um investor i know who uh they they do some gaming but they do a lot of other stuff too he his perspective is that in a year or two it'll be a great time to be investing in games because you're going to see a lot of teams that have that raised like large amounts of money and failed and are now like battle tested entrepreneurs and now and who are going to want to build things in a very different way the next time <laughs> it's just quite, <laughs> quite quite dark but interesting perspective no i think that's true and you know uh, another way to think about that now is like you know that means like today like there are companies struggling that have raised money at higher valuations than they should have in the past and are trying yeah. to like work through really difficult times trying to find solutions of where to go next and um, you know, not all of those companies, most of them don't really find that solution, unfortunately, um, and they become the investor or the founders that you're talking about. But, yeah. you know, there's also the opportunity for other types of investors in the space um, when some of these challenges arrive to, to step in, whether it's private equity or something else. So it's interesting to see how the whole ecosystem kind of, you know, evolves and forms around all of the opportunities and challenges that are constantly in flux. But um, another piece of like this equation and that affects valuations um, is, you know, maybe it has to do with interest rates. Maybe it has to do with like market sentiment as a whole. But it really revolves around this idea that a couple of years ago, like we were in an era of pretty cheap money, like valuations were high. And when valuations are high, it's easier to raise money using your equity because you give up less to get more. If interest rates are lower, you could even raise debt, which, you know, many, maybe many not startups are doing that. There is venture debt. But um, however you however you look at it, like money was easier to get. Um, but today it's a lot harder to get, which means that there are more conversations like the ones, you know, we're having right now or that I'm sure you have with founders about, you know, some of these valuations are too high. They probably should be less. But if they're less, then that also means that what they're raising might be less. The way they have to think about building their businesses from ground zero is a little different than maybe it was, you know, a few years ago. Um, could you, you know, maybe walk us through some of your thinking around this phenomenon? If the era of cheap money is over, how does that mean, you know, entrepreneurs today need to get scrappier? What does that look yeah. like in the games industry? 
curious to hear your thoughts. It's interesting. The, la- the last, the most recent gains investment we made was, uh, which was a pre-seed deal um, through our, we have a, a program called Copilot where we work very closely with founders and get much more involved than we would on a sort of traditional investment. And it was, uh, I think he's quite a good example of the type of person that we're interested in backing, which is solo dev. Uh, I think he now has like one person helping with art, but he was the only artist also for the for the past wow. for, for the past like year. Um, he, based in a um, a geo that is not San Francisco, you know, LA, New York, not not a, not a high cost geo, and a little bit kind of further out there, and is building very you know quite quite slowly something that has potentially really huge audience at the, at the other end of it um but is he's a yeah you know, one of these 10x genius solo devs who, who was you know had been in the industry for a very long time and has just been building this thing and um so i think like what what i would the the, the things that this that that this sort of i would link back to is like build, building in in sort of cheap geographies, um, building a much more systemic than content driven game. Um, I think what also. Do you mean by that? So, oh, so I mean um, a game that is not dependent on um, la- on working your way through large amounts of developer created content. So, for example, a great example of like I have very heavily co- like Baldur's Gate three. Is obviously actually both. It's heavily systemic, but it is also incredibly heavily content driven, right? You, there's no way to make that game without, you know, a, just a ton of people, um, basically. Yeah. Exactly. So, whereas a more systemic game would be Minecraft, for example. Um, so, more systemically oriented games. Um, I think also I have a, a kind of a, a word I've been a concept I've been trying to make happen uh, from again from my 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 sub stack is Ooh, let's see minimum. Your- Minimum viable fidelity, which is, I think you see this particularly people coming out of more sort of triple A high fidelity game production backgrounds is they have a, they tend to set a very very high bar for like what's what they want to what they want their game to to be to look like, and I think that most of the time people shoot too high, and if 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 you you look at look at some of the big success stories that we've seen, like it's it people will tolerate. Um, much shittier graphics than you um, yeah. than you might expect. That's so and, true. Uh, and I think really, um, and I think this also comes back to the point of like why you know why most game developers are not always the best fit for venture. It's it's the distinction between like building the game you, you've always dreamt of building that's the biggest best version of whatever it is you wanted to build versus building a company that can that can really thrive and. One of the ways to do that is, you know, keep the scope, be really ruthless about the scope, really embrace this idea of minimum viable fidelity. And um, that might not be, that might mean that that what you have to work on first is in conflict with the ideal game that you would make in under the best possible circumstances. So another potential piece of this is another buzzword that everyone is talking about, AI, which, you know potentially for good reasons, right? Like it could be part of the tooling for these teams and entrepreneurs to get more efficient and be part of the solution in this post cheap money era. And, you know, it's a technology that naturally startups should have an advantage in. Um, But I'm curious, David, how are you seeing startups you're talking to deploying AI in new and interesting ways that others could learn from? Or, you know, if some of that is too proprietary. Maybe we could even just take it in a direction of like, how do you think this technology might provide startups an advantage over legacy incumbents and make a, a lot of what you're saying about you know being scrappy as entrepreneurs more viable? So I think there is definitely some at least sort of short term, uh, I guess, counter positioning opportunity available to startups. Um, and by that, I mean... Uh, I think that the the large, you know, your your sort of Activision Blizzards of the world are uh, are going to be more reluctant because there's you know a lot of un- outstanding unresolved issues around legal and copyright. And as a startup, you're probably more more inclined to just be like, well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like let let people with much larger 
you know, much larger budgets worry about it. So you could, there's an argument that you could say, you'll they'll embrace these tools much more aggressively. Um, I do think that it is going to mean even, you know, some of these 10x developers that I've been talking about, you know, maybe become 100x developers actually, <laughs> um, because they can just do things before that with these tools that were just impossible previously. Um, and so I think like that, that we, we will see, I think actually that, that really is like the, the area of the market, which is most exciting to me because you, you, it's just making, making it possible for, for, for these small teams to do, to do, to do huge stuff. Um, as far as I, I think where I'm still figuring out is to what extent any of this is actually a source of sustainable competitive advantage as opposed to just a tool that everyone uses in the same way that you know people use better software all the time and it helps them be more productive um i i you know we do have one um investment in the portfolio it's actually our first investment was series uh, series ai um that really they are they are a kind of ai native game studio and they're they've embraced a lot of these tools very very aggressively in a building have have really been also building a lot of stuff you know that's kind of proprietary internally and so i think there may be some some companies that just push the envelope as far as like what can actually be done with this in terms of what kinds of games can you now make that were not not possible before but um i i think i'm, I'm sort of a little bit reluctant to get too far ahead of my skis here like i i because i sort of find that often like i remember if you remember like back when um uh Microsoft was pushing the last Xbox. They were making a big deal about cloud, and like they were, the cloud was going to be cloud native console, and there were kinds of games that you could just never even imagine because they'll be like hybrid cloud native things, right? And like, I think we're still waiting to see like one example of like what all this cloud, this super amazing cloud uh, technology and infrastructure enabled from a gameplay perspective. So I think I'm similarly sort of. Um, and we do have a studio, and you know, we do have another studio that's unannounced investment. That's um, you know a really great developer that's that's also doing some interesting things with a lot of AI and gameplay and agents and that sort of thing. But you know, it's hard enough to make like a really fun new kind of gameplay using you know just tried and tested predictable tools. And uh, AI is like the opposite of that. It's like so many of these technologies are, are just like fundamentally non-deterministic, which makes them even more difficult to yeah. work with in a, in a game because games tend to be about systems that, that perform, you know, in somewhat predictable ways. Um, so I, you know, I'm not holding my breath for the next genre, you know, crazy big new genre, but Hey, I'd love to see it. And I'd love, I hope we invest in it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what that'll look like either. Um, I have similar hesitations just because AI doesn't replace creativity. Um, it can make things more efficient, no. but at the end of the day, it's not, the the brains behind like entirely new and interesting ideas maybe one day it will be but that seems pretty pretty far far out there um but i guess i would push back a little bit and saying like i do think that there will be pretty strong relative advantage for those that do and don't adopt these tools and i think in the same way it's probably easy to overplay how transformative a lot of this technology is in the near term i think it's also it's easy to underplay just how slow and lethargic the the biggest publishers um, making the biggest games are going to be adopting these tools not just because they're big and slow and like need legal approval for everything but working with big IPs I've just kind of been able to pick up like you can't even touch you know any form of AI tooling generally if you're working with the biggest IPs um, uh, also just a lot of these large companies AI tooling you know, is a lot of employees view it as a threat instead of an opportunity. And so it becomes like a cultural issue. And, you know, just imagine trying to adopt these tools while working with a union. You know, if you're, again, like Microsoft in, in some way in certain parts of their business, that's that's going to be enormously challenging. And it's going to enable some companies just to move way faster. And as a startup, you know, speed is often the best advantage you really have. And I think that's going to shine really brightly with these AI tools. Do you agree I, with that? I, I do agree with you. I, I think that the thing that kind of maybe the footnote I would add to my original comment is I think I see that 
the tools as as I think it's going to be about are you able to use these tools to help you more quickly and efficiently establish some other form of sustainable com competitive advantage and to the extent that you're able to do that uh, that you're able to use them to do that then yes you can create huge value but the value it's is not necessarily going to come from the AI stuff itself if you see what I mean yeah uh, another you know term that's been thrown out a lot lately is distribution and you know the idea of distribution advantages um, which you know that's not new either distribution advantages have been fundamental to gaming in basically every industry ever um, for as long as business has has been a thing um, and so you know you can look across all sorts of big waves like you mentioned mobile as a form of you know unlocking a, a distribution advantage or a new form of distribution that really was a rising tide for a lot of industry for a lot of companies that were able to unlock value by doing that but I found that the concept of distribution, unlocking new unique distribution, that gets talked about a lot more in industries that become more stagnant or slower <laughs> growing. Um, and so it's not a surprise to see the industry have more of this conversation lately um, because it's harder to come by. It's harder to unlock you know, entirely new forms of distribution advantages. But it still is really important, um, especially when you're building new companies, because the whole idea of, you know, if you build it, they will come that almost always doesn't work. And you if you want to stand out above the rest, you have to be thoughtful about distribution. Um, so, you know, beyond me stating the obvious, I'm curious, like how you think about that from, you know, looking at these companies, like what types of distribution levers and advantages are you finding like are you seeing yeah. entrepreneurs pitching today or that you wish they were pitching more today um how do you think about this right now the first of the first thing to note is like finding distribution advantage it's like really hard <laughs> um yeah <laughs> and 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 sometimes sometimes it's driven by uh developments that are outside of your control to a degree right so you know one i wrote an article recently uh, kind of really digging into Valve, like history of Steam, and looking at what what it was, what was possible, what were the conditions that made it possible for Valve to make the strategic move that they did, right? Um, and there were things that you know that, that at that point in time all co all came together to make it possible for Valve to build Steam, um, and um, you know those those windows don't always open; they're not in, open indefinitely, right? Um, so part of and, and it's a good question. Like, what what windows are open or are opening, you know, now or are open now um, that will unlock new potential sources of distribution advantage? If I was gonna sort of uh, say, well, like, where would I be fishing? You know, where do I think is an interesting place to be fishing right now? It might be the web um, because the developments that have happened in terms of what kind of process? What sort of processing power is available in just the average computer that someone owns, combined with technologies um, that make it much, much like allow you to deliver experiences that are really high fidelity and um, and beautiful and interactive in the browser. Um, that could create some interesting, you know, that could create some interesting opportunities, right? You know, you can have something that goes viral and people can share it, and all of a sudden, you know, a million people have have, have played your game in in, a, in you know in a handful of days. Um, I kind of remember some of that from the early days of, you know, Facebook. Um, it might also be that, you know, I, I would also keep an eye on software platforms like Discord, you know, there, there might be some interesting opportunities there. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's sort of one, one thing. Uh, and, and then I think the other, as far as like game developers go, de game development goes, I think the other, another way of thinking about distribution, it's not really distribution advantage exactly, but it's, it's, it's very closely related, which is, it's sort of finding pockets of audience that are overlooked and uh, tapping and thinking, how do I how do I reach them and how do I tap into them? And um, like we have we have a portfolio company that is doing that has a very interesting approach to this, but uh, that I won't talk about. <laughs> I won't talk about. But I will I will share a story I remember from my friend Bertrand Vernizzo, who's a really interesting guy um, who is a uh, they, he's not a VC. They, they invest in a lot of a lot of uh, sort of premium 
Steam games, but has a very uh, independent mindset. And he talked about getting pitched by the developers of Power Wash Simulator, which, you know, is a surprisingly large, uh, or, or well, I guess not surprisingly large, uh, when I finished the story, um, you know, game and, and, and IP. And he remembered the pitch and the guy basically was like pulling up Google Trends and being like, Look how many people are just obsessed with power washing. <laughs> Basically, I'm I'm butchering. This is like a third hand retelling of the story, <laughs> but like that was like a un- that was a, just a, a really interesting example of an audience insight that was like, okay, there were not there's a million people trying to make the next you know MOBO or whatever, and like, oh no, there's no, but there's zero games about power washing, and yet there's loads of people that are really interested in power washing, and we think we can build something for them, and um. You know that is a an, an audience. In some ways, you know, you could look at in some ways you could look at the the story of Riot Games as being a little bit of that as well, right? There was a sort of observation that 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 Dota Two was oh, sorry, not Dota Two. That Dota that the original Dota mod was this massive audience that was fragmented across all these different games, and really their strategy was we're gonna we're gonna roll them all up. And uh, it was part of their, so it was part of their distribution strategy, it was part of their product strategy. And so I think uh, thinking always about audience and where, who are these audiences that are underserved, that are maybe not, and, and where, where do they hang out? Where can I reach them, you know, cheaply? <laughs> um, that, that's also, I think, closely related to this idea. And then, you know, you obviously have to have a plan that allows you to then build some, some, a, a strong you know, competitive position went off the back of that distribution advantage that you've identified. Otherwise it gets, you know, Mitch Lasky talks a lot about this, you know, otherwise it just will get arbitraged away. Um, and so um, that's, you know, that's the other piece of it. Yeah. You also wrote a good piece about the seven powers and how it applies to gaming companies, especially at the early stages. And I feel like a lot of these conversations that we've been having kind of around getting scrappy AI, unique forms of competitive advantage. It all it all kind of ties into this. So maybe you could share briefly what the seven powers idea is and then which ones apply to gaming founders in interesting ways. Yeah. Um, so the seven powers is it's from a book by uh, a guy called Hamil- Hamilton Helmer. And um, it's really a framework for thinking about where sustain where moats come from it's a sort of taxonomy of different kinds of moats and you know the reason that these that these moats are important is most businesses it's a um, you know there's a main point i make in this article is that you know we we, we encourage to think about competition as being you know part of your job as an entrepreneur is to compete really effectively and if you're really good at competing then you then you can win and build a valuable company but the sort of the more accurate way to think about competition is that the most valuable companies have found ways to escape competition. Um, they're not competing on a level playing field with everyone else, right? And uh, because if you're competing, the more competitors you have, the the more likely it is that you are going to be forced to your prices are your profits are going to be driven down, but because there's just so many other places that people can get a comparable, you know, product or service or experience from. And so um, the seven powers are basically, basically a, a list of these different forms that this that these moats can take, and um, they are their scale economies, network effects, counter positioning, switching costs, branding, cornered resource, and uh, process power. And I will not. I'm, this is not going to be a seven. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be on this podcast for another three hours if I if I take you through the whole thing. But um, the. I think the other point, key point, is there are different powers that are available to companies at different stages in their in their sort of evolution. And so, for us as like a, a venture investor, um, I think it's really the one that that most apply to startups are. And I think there's one really important one, which is counter positioning, which is yeah, you know, the idea that uh, you can, as a newcomer, adopt a a business model that is superior to the incumbent, but they won't or can't copy it because of some sort of anticipated damage to their existing business. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about AI a little bit in this framework, right? Like startups can and probably embrace it more aggressively than incumbents um, because incumbents have got a lot more to lose. They're the ones who are going to get sued, um, you know, in, in big lawsuits. And so, 
if you if you if you embrace all these tools really aggressively, you're going to be able to probably be making games at a you know one percent of the cost, of one five ten percent of the cost of of a big company. Um, so, um, but then as these as you sort of um, as the com- as companies evolve, they tend to build um, other kinds of of moats that make it really hard for other people to com- compete with them. So in games, you know. I would say network effects are a very are, are quite a, quite a common uh, quite a common one. Network effects and and also scale economies and you know, network effects being, you know, if you have a game that Clash Royale, which I used to play you know, a lot of, right? They have a they have a huge network effect in that. Uh, you know, and the idea of a network effect is that the 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 whole platform becomes more valuable with each addition with it with each incremental user that is added to it. Um, and in the case of a game, that can be because um, it helps with player liquidity. It also means uh, other kinds of things around the ecosystem become more interesting. You know, like e- then you can build an eco- esports ecosystem around it, for example. Um, so th- things like that. I think another one that's that's that, that's sort of uh, that's built into games a lot is uh, switching costs. Um, so you know, the longer you spend in a particular game. Yeah, you and you're building a kind of whole collection of stuff. You're probably reluctant. You know, all these skins and so on. You're sort of reluctant to to move on from them. Um, and then, um, and then like another couple that are very relevant to game companies that are kind of more later stage ones that you know going back to the earlier point in our conversation, these are things that evolve over a long period of time. Are brand and pro- process power. So brand, you know, you. You, you really you, there's no shortcut to building a brand like you can't build a brand quickly like brands are only built by repeatedly sort of fulfilling a promise to a group of people um, over a, over a long period of time and um, and then process power which is you know there are some games that are just incredibly that certain studios are just much better at making because they have done so much to build infrastructure and resources um, to make those games well. Yeah, we could spend a lot of time digging into to all of those, but I'll I'll kind of fold this into a much simpler question, which is given all of those advantages, given all the technology trends we've talked about, given the state of venture in the games industry, um, based on all of that, like what do you see as underhyped or undervalued in the state of gaming today? I will tell you, I'm gonna answer a slightly different question. Um, okay, which is like less, but thinking again about this idea of like what's going on right now that is a disruptive environment, you know, shift that therefore I would I would want to as a founder investigate. And the one that springs to mind for me, literally like today, because I think it was announced like maybe just yesterday. I think this 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 move that Meta has made to open up um, their VR operating system and to Huge. sort of pivot into becoming the sort of Android of a V. I mean, I realized that the, the, the OS is actually, it's a fork of Android itself, but this idea that it's going to be moving away from this Apple like vertically integrated closed ecosystem. And there's going to be different kinds of devices with focused on different sorts of things. That's the, that feels to me at a gut level, like, Oh, things are being shaken up a little bit here. Um, and there might be really interesting that creates that's going to just you you want you know in venture and as an entrepreneur you want you know someone to come along and shake the uh, the uh, the the you know the snow globe <laughs> weird analogy but you know what i mean you want no, I get you, it. Want, you want you want things to be kind of shaken up a little bit and like that to me makes me think whereas we have not yet made a vr investment and i you know, i speak as someone who was I, a very early enthusiast we were i think my, you know gaming insiders we were one of the we maybe hosted the first public demo of like the first like developer version of the of the you know the uh, the DK one or whatever it was called, um, and um, and so but but you know I, I think VR has consistently failed to fulfill the the kind of the expectations that certainly we as venture investors need to in order to underwrite you know making a a, a company hitting that kind of growth trajectory that we want, but I might I might be tempted to reevaluate that. In the bait, you know, in in the light of, of of what's happening, you know, what 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 may come in the wake of this. Whereas I think actually, I was pretty, I was kind of keeping an eye on Vision Pro, but I, I think Vision Pro in its current form looks 
pretty dead on arrival, actually, uh, in terms yeah, of a, pretty rough. A, something that's that's a that's a developer ecosystem that's going to be in, at all interesting in any way. Um, so you know, that's kind of top of mind for me the, this week. <laughs> yeah, that's not where I thought you were going to take that. So it's really interesting. I mean, I'm I'm pretty bullish on both uh, Meta from here and open sourcing their platform makes a ton of sense. Um, and I think that even if you you say that the the Vision Pro is dead on arrival. There's a lot of levers Apple can pull to, oh, you know, sure. seed its ecosystem. But yeah, it's exciting. Like this is like the next clearest wave of consumer tech that, you know, as you say, it shakes the snow globe. Um, and where yeah. there's chaos, there can be opportunity. So, um, yes. so really as, interesting. As, as Lil Finger would say, chaos is a ladder. <laughs> Indeed. Well said. Um, well, cool. I guess, you know, another question I have, you know, given all the things we've talked about too, the the trends, the technology, state of the market, um, how does that impact not not just the kinds of companies that you're looking for, but like the way that you approach, you know, constructing a portfolio as a venture firm right now? How, how are you thinking about that bigger picture? It's figuring out there's two, there's really two, two kinds of investment that we make. So we invest at pre-seed, and when I say pre-seed, I really mean it's yeah, it's inception stage, right? The company maybe has raised zero outside money or maybe a tiny amount from friends and family. Um, and there, what we've sort of realized, and, and what's quite interesting at pre-seed is there's a, actually a huge range of valuations and expectations and amounts of money that people raise. And um, what we have concluded is what makes sense for us coming back to like what is our own unique you know what are our own unique competitive advantages what both Joachim and I spent you know 20 odd years as 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 founders and so we sort of took the decision that our pre-seed investing is going to be done exclusively through a program uh, we call Copilot which basically involves us rolling up our sleeves sitting down with an entrepreneur helping them really work through their plan for the business and how it's how it's going to be funded. Their pitch, how they're going to tell the story of their company and make it in a way that is compelling to uh, people like us, basically. Yeah. And then their process, their fundraising process. So we'll actually actively get involved and reach out to VCs that we think are a good fit for the kind of thing that this company is doing. And we'll we'll kind of give our own pitch as to why we think that the other company is worth worth meeting with. And and in exchange for doing that, it's kind of all sort of, I guess, services for equity, but the way we structure it is we get a really compelling um, entry price, like a really much, much lower than some of the pre-seed value. And we see a lot of stuff, as I've mentioned, you know, we see a lot of stuff where there's really nothing more than the pitch deck and they're already trying to raise at, you know, 10 million, you know, pre-money plus, but nothing's been de-risked. And so for us, um, we don't really want to do deals like that, we want to instead at the very early stage kind of use our entrepreneurial muscles to, to help influence that early trajectory of the company and earn the, 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 uh, the that really good equity position. The other thing that it allows us to do from a sort of uh, a, an investing perspective is most of the time, when you if you're talking to a company during a fundraise, that's a very constrained period of time during which to get to know some, you know, some founders, right? Um, maybe you have a couple of meetings, two, three meetings, um, and then you do, you, know, you do your reference checks and you, you make a decision. And if, if the round gets competitive, you know, things can, can move very, very quickly. And you know, one advantage here is we can really get to know people outside of that typical fundraising cycle. And that's something that we can use then to inform our future. You know, we, can, we can reinvest if we, if we feel like um, you know, things are going really well. We have you know, it, you can't you can't trade on insider information, you know, in the public markets, but you absolutely can, and you want to in the private markets, right? And so it's a sort of a way for us to develop like stronger conviction by just having a working relationship with founders. And so we sort of thought, okay, we want to do that as our pre-seed investing, and then seed we invest on market terms. We're happy to pay up, you know, quite quite meaningfully if if there is strong evidence of product market fit and real traction that we can evaluate. Um, and so, uh, and we, and we sort of don't want to do anything in between. And we found that to be quite clarifying um, because just the nature of venture is 
you know, we probably see, uh, we probably see 1200 companies a year at least. Um, and you want, it's important to have some sort of heuristic that allows you to focus your brain power on just the things that are like relevant for you. Um, and this is a good way for us to do that. That's exciting. Um, and a really unique approach. And I'm excited to learn how that goes over the next few years and kind of what you learn by by getting into the trenches in a deeper, earlier way um, than other investors. Um, I also want to give you a chance just to, to quickly, you know, uh, pitch this um, to to any founders here who are listening. Like, what what kinds of companies are, like, the best fit to, you know, either get investment from you guys or to even kind of consider working with you in the the mm. program you mentioned super early stage yeah um so look we're, we're really excited to meet founders like some of our investments we we made we we, we started talking to the founder even before that there, there was a company um and so that's you know that's totally fine with us um we invest as i say in the the future of media and communications um we love gaming founders that, you know, games is so competitive and like so much about gaming is learning how to do incredibly good go to market and how to build highly engaging products. I think there is huge opportunity for founders to take those skills and apply them in all sorts of other domains. There's been a lot of success stories from founders from games taking their those skills and building great companies elsewhere. We, we, we'd love to do more of those. Um, I would say on the gaming, look, we do invest in games. Uh, I think we're particularly excited about the more sort of solo developer um, doing something a bit weird. Um, again, we really love people who have a, a unique audience insight. Um, and so, you know, we're still very much open for business on the gaming side, even though we do a lot of other things as well. And um, and uh, I, I think beyond that, we're, we're, we're pretty open. You know, we, we try and get a response to everyone that pitches us um, just because I think that's a founder who always frustrated me to sort of be, feel like I was firing emails into a black hole. So it, it, it might just be a quick no, but a quick no is a lot better than nothing. So we'll, um, you know, don't ever, have, don't hesitate to re reach out. Um, yeah, as I say, we're really excited in both in, in the, the super early stage working with founders in a very personal way. And then if you're at seed and, you know, things are really going, going well, then, um, you know, we'd love to talk to you as well, of course, like <laughs> us and every other VC on the planet, uh, but particularly... <laughs> But particularly if your if, if if your business could be accelerated by in some way by really strong access into the sort of the gaming or the media ecosystem more broadly, then we can be very helpful there too. Yeah, no no downside in reaching out. If people want to to do that, where is the best place to connect with you or reach out? Um, you can email me. I'm uh, David at f four uh, dot just let, letter f number four dot fund. Uh, similarly, our website f four fund f four dot fund has a uh, a pitch form, which we you know we do look at everything there. Um, so either of those two ways are probably the best. Uh, and David, one last question. I I've, I've talked about your writing a bunch on this episode. Um, for those that want to get your your essays and read them as soon as they come out, where should they they go and su subscribe to that? Uh, you can just go to davidk.co and uh, it'll take you to my Substack. Cool. Yeah, I strongly recommend it. I'll also include the the link to that in the show notes so you can see it very simply and easily there. Um, but with that, David, I think that's the perfect place to wrap up. Thank you as always for for joining me on the podcast here. It's always fun talking to you and hearing about what's on your mind. And best wishes to you and F4 going forward. Thanks, Aaron. It's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.